Right. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Michael, for being on here. This is such a treat. I know for so many of us here, if you're on this Zoom call, I have, I'm assuming you know who Michael Neal is. Um, and I want to, first of all, thank you. Really, this is, this is such a treat. And I know you're so busy. You just have a, a, a new book out and it's already absolutely amazing. And I want to start off with the first question. And after that, I want to give it to the people in this group. But cool. Because we only have an hour and I want to get as much time with you and the group members. And I want to just start it off with a quick question, which, which I think is really neat. You have the late, last three books that you had was The Inside Out Revolution, The Space Within, and also your latest book, Creating the Impossible. And I noticed even though they speak about the principles and the inside out paradigm, they had a different flavor. Each book was different. And you actually mentioned one was spiritual, one was psychological, and the latest book was practical. So it's a twofold question. Was that done on purpose? And also, um, how did you come about having it have a different flavor? I think that's genius. Well, I'm almost embarrassed to admit that it was intentional because I think we're supposed to be spontaneous in the principles, aren't we? We're not supposed to have intentions. But uh, fortunately, I'd never read the manual, so <laughs> it was it, it. It it did come to me spontaneously to plan it. Um, I I just noticed that there were people who found it easiest to grab. I've always had this metaphor um, of of a of a, a coffee mug with many handles. That that the coffee is what's on offer. And, and yeah, you need to have good coffee. The mug is the container. That's the course, the book, the program. The handle is what makes it easy for somebody to pick it up and drink from it. And I noticed that the handle is the least, I've got the least attachment to what the handle is. Then my second least attachment is to what the shape of the mug is. And then I'm really interested in the coffee. So I noticed in my work that there were people who really got into this conversation from the spiritual. There were people who really got into it from the practical, what it can do for them, for their business, and people who really got into it through the psychological and what it can do for their heads. And so I thought, well, okay, those are the three handles to get people to try this coffee. Because I know once they drink the coffee, great things happen. And I noticed it in my programs and courses, and then it was like, well, I, the books should do this. They should come at it from these different ways. So it wasn't when I did Inside Out Revolution, I was not sure I was going to do that. Once Inside Out Revolution kind of took off and took on a life of its own, I got very clear. I wanted to hit the other two angles of approach. And, uh, and I was also insistent with the publisher, they wanted to bring out Creating the Impossible first. I was insistent that we did it the other way around because in my mind, if people first saw the practical, they might never get past it. But if they had to wade through the psychological and the spiritual to get to the practical, then they're more likely to get the big picture. Um, now, that may have been nutty on my, my part. Like, I may have just been wrong about that. But that's why the books came out in the sequence they came out in. Well, it came out perfectly. And I think that was absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you. Wow. Cool. Thanks. So let's, let's, let's get it to... Uh, to the people here, and are you, uh, Lynn, are you going to be the one that's kind of going to be handling that? Yeah. Okay with that? Yeah, so if you guys, uh, I've got you all muted at the moment, so best thing to do is you want to come on and speak to Michael, just raise your digital hand, and then I will unmute you and bring you on. And if there's any particular order, Amir, you can just guide me if you want to go in. And, and how do people raise a digital hand if they don't know? Good point, yeah. So if you go down to your participants box, there should be an option there to raise your digital hand. Nobody's dialing in on the phone, so I don't need to give those instructions. But if you were, you would do star nine. So let's kick off and let's go to Sue first. Go ahead, Sue, you're unmuted. Hi, I'm Michael. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello there. Um, Hello. Hello. Sorry. Somebody's cackling away in the background. All right. I'm muting you, Brooke. We know what this is. All right. Okay. Hiya. Hey. Right. Okay. I, I've only been in the principal for about four months now, you know, um, I've had severe agoraphobia for 19 years. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Nicola at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
But I have bouts of depression that keep me in bed with no energy. How do I use the, because I know it's only a thought that's doing that. So how do I kind of overcome that thought to get out of bed, to do things? Because that's what I want to do. Mm. But I just feel so exhausted. I'm just in bed all day, every day. And it's just horrible. Yeah. No, and I and I'm with you. Like I I know. So I'll I'll share with you my metaphor for depression, because this and this was both how I experienced it, but how I see it in other people, and it's intimately linked with anxiety. And 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 it's the it's the hotel hair dryer. Right. The yeah the obvious one right. That's where you were going to. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, so in most hotels I go to, the hair dryer has a um, an overheating override. So if it starts to overheat, it switches off because they don't yeah. want you burning down your hotel room. Uh, well, our brains seem to work kind of like that. When, when we get to a certain level of spin where the whole system is so full of adrenaline and, and, and epinephrine and all the different chemicals that get spun out by the brain and by when thought spins, the system as a sort of a safety measure switches off and that utter lack of feeling that we call depression is actually the system taking care of itself and kind of going, Hey, we need to cool down here. Now, if we don't freak out that we're depressed, if we don't turn it into a, a thing, a disease, an illness that we need to overcome, that's actually a relief to go to bed for a day let the thing settle. And then as we get better at not winding ourselves back up, that mechanism kicks in less and less of the time to the point where maybe it never kicks in and you don't even know that your hairdryer has that setting because you never overrun it. Oh, I've, I've, yeah. It's a ahead. lot quicker for me to overcome now, but I just got so frustrated because I just, you know, want to go out and do things, you know, 18 years, I haven't been able to do it. And, and now I can, I want to go and do it. Yeah. So the, the, the nice thing about having been shut in for 19 years is if you, if you still lose the occasional day, yeah, 19 years in a day, you know? Yeah, it, true. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? It's, it's, I, I, I have a, I have a huge faith in the system. I have a huge faith in the self-correcting nature of it, but you have to let it self-correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. A pleasure, Sue. Thank you. Okay. Now let's go and see that I'm just going to mispronounce your name. So I apologize in advance. Is it Nafatali? Go ahead. Cause you're unmuted. Pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Not bad. <laughs> hey, Michael. Hey. Um, my question is, I've heard you tell the story a few times in a few different ways about telling one of your early clients, uh, you don't have to think about this. And, and one of your mentors saying, well, no, you know, what I said to you was, you don't have to think this. And if we're not in control of our thoughts, um, what differentiation do you make between those two different statements? Well, there, there's a notion in neuroscience that colloquially is called free won't, right? So you've heard of free will, but free won't points to the fact that what we seem to have is an override button. So we can say no to a thought. We can't decide which thoughts come up when but we do have a degree of control over which ones we hang out with. So they, they it, so, so it's essentially where we've got I, the phrase that I use a lot at the moment to kind of speak to that balance between not having control, but not being helpless is it's not up to you, but it's not, not up to you. So it isn't up to you what you think, but it's not not up to you what you think. You have a degree of an ability to not dwell on the shit if you don't want to, if it doesn't make sense to you to, right? And you exercise it all day long, right? You exercise it when you're, 
you know, in a meeting thinking about sex or a nice meal, and you hopefully put the thought about sex or the nice meal to one side long enough to actually stay present to the meeting. Sometimes you lose that battle, right? Mm -hmm. but, but we have that all day long. So you don't have to think that isn't you have to think this. It's just literally, you don't have to go with the way that you're making it up right now. You can let it make something else up and then let it make something else up. And at some point, it'll make something up the like. And then you can dance with that one. Thank you. And sort of a follow on, if I may. Um, do you, I'm not asking like where does it come from, but does it interest you where thought comes from? Like where it's actually generated? You know, it, it interests me at the level of if it brings me closer to God, because I think it comes from whatever that space is that we equate with the infinite. Now, it shows up in the brain. I have friends who do brain mapping. I have a, a, a very good friend who's got her doctorate doing brain mapping. And she can tell me exactly where it shows up in the brain, but that doesn't mean to my mind that it comes from there. Mm -hmm. That's just where it shows up. My daughter, when she was six, um, actually, she might have been even younger than six, freaked my wife out by asking her where babies come from. And my wife, like, oh, my God, okay, do, do we tell her? Do we talk to her? She's too young, but we, we, I don't want to be honest with her. And went through all this and went to her mom and said, Mom, what do, what do I say to Clara? And, and her mom said, oh, let me handle it. And so, so Granny comes to Clara and Clara says, Granny, where do babies come from? And, and Granny said, from the baby place. And Clara went, oh, okay. And didn't ask that question again for about 10 years. Mm -hmm by which point I think she probably knew, right? It, it, it's, to my mind, uh, an interesting distraction if what you want is a better life and an interesting exploration if you're just interested. But it's not necessary to know. It's just like, I love exploring what is that space within us that all of this comes through? What is this infinite void that somehow all of this stuff comes out of, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I kind of know that other than labeling it, I can only sense it. Right. Okay. I'll go with that. Cool. Thanks. Cool. cool. Thank you. Okay. Next up, let's go to Tony. Go ahead, Tony. You're unmuted. Hi, Michael. It's um, Tony from London here. Um, hey, Tony from London. First thing to say, I've got your new book. Thank you very much. Um, the, the, and I'm also reading them. In, I haven't read it yet. I've got the new book, but I'm reading them in order, you know, in terms of the way that you publish the books. Um, but the question I've got is I, I, I'm also new to the principles and I, I, I kind of come from NLP, hypnotherapy background, and I've come into the principles. And I, I am you, so, so please bear with me when asking this question because I'm confused, so maybe you could help me articulate it. But the, the question I'm trying to ask you is, I see a distinction between your style of writing and teaching to what I've also listened to a lot of, which is the Keith Blevins and Valder Monroe style of describing the single paradigm. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that there's a difference in the, in the teaching styles in what you're both sharing, but to me, there sounds like there is. And the differences I hear from them is they don't confuse between what they say splitting thought between good and bad you're either inside the paradigm or you're outside the paradigm and you could feel really shitty but be inside the paradigm but the most important thing is knowing where your feelings are coming from and 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 that's kind of it i know there's much more to it because obviously falling into the outside in paradigm is going to cause lots of problems if you don't know you're in it but I just wondered what your view is if you do have one on those two different teaching styles, because I personally feel that one of the things I try to do, Michael, is I try to pick the right way to learn something. So I get the best experience of it. And I can sometimes confuse myself by, you know, listening to lots of different things and ending up in a bit of a mess as to well, what, 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 
because I kind of hear that the way they're describing it is the real way. I'm not saying they've said that, but, but I just wonder what your take on it was, the difference in the style. No, I, I, first off, there's a clear difference in the style. So I, I think you're picking up yeah. on something that's absolutely there. I think, and I've spent a lot of time with Keith and Valda, so I can speak to their intent reasonably. I'm not saying right. accurately, but, but not unreasonably. And when they were first beginning to teach a single paradigm, I, I, over that period of time, I was working with them every week. And one of the things that I noted about it, not so much when they taught it, but when I heard their students teach, was I said, mind isn't really, there's not much mind in it. Like there's a lot of thought and consciousness. Really see mind. And, and, and it was quite cute. They came back the next week and they showed me their new chart and yeah. they'd written the word mind much bigger. Huh. Right? Now, they bring so much presence of mind to their teaching that when you are with Keith and Valda, it, it, you get mind even though they're talking about thought and consciousness. A lot of students of theirs that I have seen teach, you get psychology. You get a better psychology, but what the principles to me as a teaching were originally an attempt to articulate was what is this oneness that we are all of and how do we experience more of it in our life? So mm -hmm. to an extent, here's the problem with your strategy, your learning strategy, is if this was content being taught by people, finding the best people and the best way of teaching learn relevant. But to an extent, what all of us are trying to point everyone to is the teacher within. Mm. So in a way, it doesn't matter which of us you respond to. If as a result of listening to us, you go to that deeper place beyond the known in you. That's why even Sid said, hey, if you're listening to one of my CDs and you find yourself in a nice feeling, throw the CD out the window and stay with the feeling, stay with the inner teacher, stay with your connection to this deeper mind. Yeah. Okay. So to me, it's just like handles on the coffee mug. Doesn't matter. Okay. Whatever, whatever makes it easiest for you to taste the coffee. Okay. That, that's yeah. the teaching to follow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cheers, cool. Michael. Thanks, Tony. Cheers, mate. Okay, next up, let's go to Robert. Go ahead, Robert, you're unmuted. Hey, Michael. Hello. Uh, my question, your last comment uh, about the nice feeling and throwing the CD away is kind of a segue into my question. I'm really taken with this notion of innate well-being. Um, and I'm curious how I get past intellectually believing that that is so to actually the experience where I know that that is so. Can you well, speak to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I can speak to it kind of just almost personally, like, you know, I, I, I had a client who said to me actually at the beginning of our time working together, I love this, this notion of innate well being. He said, I don't have it, but I love that other people might. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I laughed and realized he wasn't kidding, right? And then about six weeks later, we've been talking every week, and, and he said, I had an experience this morning. He said, I woke up in the morning, and instead of, like, starting my day and, and, and getting into everything that I'm up to, I, I just lay in bed, and I was in this amazing feeling. He said it was like the feeling after an orgasm, but it, I hadn't had an orgasm, and it, it went on for hours. And eventually I kind of got up and began my day and it stayed with me for a bit and disappeared. He said, could that be that innate well-being you've been talking about? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, 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 I think it could be. The way you get from intellectual understanding to knowing is feeling. And the way you get to feeling is feeling. <laughs> but not trying to feel that feeling. Right. I wrote an article once, I can't remember if I ever published it, called Curse That Definite Article, which is a very overly intellectual way of speaking about. I had chased the feeling for a long time. 
And I suddenly mm -hmm. realized the feeling comes through feeling. And my unwillingness to feel certain things cut me off from all depth of feeling. Whereas when feelings just looked like what happens inside the body, and I became less controlling or attempting to, I was never good at it, attempting to control what I was feeling, then I experienced not only a lot more emotion, but I experienced a lot more of this deeper spaciousness because I had opened the system up. I'd opened myself up to that in me. And so I, 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 don't, I don't have a technique way of getting there. But for me, I got there by, by realizing that the only way to get to the feeling was through feeling. That's actually a useful pointer. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Robert. Okay, who is next? Raise your little digital hand and Michael is all yours. <laughs> Sounds really dodgy when you say Yeah, it, it does, hand. yeah. yeah. What I say? <laughs> and if not, we'll just make a mere ask really difficult questions. Yeah, no, that's like my that's like one of my favorite jokes. My, my wife tricked me into marrying her. She told me that she liked me. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Phil next. Go ahead, Phil. You're unmuted. Hello. Hello. Hey everyone. Phil. Nice to see you. Hello. Thank you. Um, so I guess a question is really around um, how far do you think this understanding can take us really as a species? Because I find myself having my own little internal battle, if you like, between like what I might term the purity of this understanding and then um, really allowing our human side. There's, uh, I see a lot of people peddling that this, this understanding is like the answer to everything and will bring world peace. And then I kind of realized, well, I've been around this understanding for probably since about 2010, 2011. And, and you don't have world peace yet? No. <laughs> Jesus, Phil, come on, man. Time's a-wasting. <laughs> you know, still, like, incredibly heartbroken last year from a breakup and still find myself getting pissed off and angry and things. So I, I kind of want to, I mean, I, I asked a question in this group, but me won't mind this. I asked a question in this group. So for those of you who take, like, a, a purist view of this understanding, do you still engage in foreplay? Because that, that, that kind of summarizes where, where I'm coming from. You know, if we, if we, if we, believe everything is we don't have to have to do anything externally to to uh or, or we don't need to do anything to manage our experience of life then would you still engage in foreplay because we're still here to have an adventure of this thing called life so my question is really do you think this understanding could bring world peace or are we still always going to have this human element where we do fall out with each other and we do misunderstand each other Okay, so I'm going to answer the three questions that I think are on the table. Okay. First, yes, I do have foreplay whenever possible. <laughs> Basically, whenever my wife lets me. Two, um, uh, the less important questions, world peace. Uh, there's something behind that question and behind what I heard in your question, which is the idea that if this were true, we wouldn't feel certain ways, we would only feel other ways. Now, I don't see that as an implication of the principles at all. No. I see the principles as an explanation of why we feel all these different things when we feel them, not a means to not feel them. And the value of the principles is, if all it is is the flow of thought taking form in, in, in me, that, that, then I don't need to kill you to change how I feel. So it's not that I'm not going to get pissed off and upset and angry and scared. It's that I'm less likely to blame another race, another religion, another sex, another person for it, which means I'm less likely to go to war over it, right? It doesn't mean I'm not going to really want uh, nice stuff. It means I'm less likely to think that without nice stuff, I'm not good enough. So I'm less likely to go to war with you to get your stuff and, and make sure I've got more stuff than anyone else. 
Right. So yeah, I do absolutely think it can lead us towards peace, but not because we'll stop being human, but because we'll have sufficient understanding of the human experience that we don't overreact to everything that we feel and try to change the world to change it. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Phil. Okay, next I'm going to bring on oops, John. Go ahead, John, you're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? I can indeed. Hey, hello, Michael. Um, my question is, what is um, um, the pressure I feel in my upper forehead? And my mind feels as still as a pond on a calm day, but whenever I have this, um, I guess you could say stillness of mind, I feel this pressure in, up in my forehead, kind of like at just above my nose. And I also came to the realization recently that um you know i used to have these sort of like feelings of oneness with things but i had this sort of interesting realization recently and that is is the oneness i feel with everything in a sense an illusion in and of itself <laughs> i'm sorry i'm laughing john but it's like you know so let's start with the little stuff um <laughs> Okay. Okay. So I'm going to try and answer both questions. I'm no going to start with the second one. Okay. Um, I can't tell you whether what you're feeling is real or an illusion. The feeling is real, right? What you're attributing it to, I don't know. But the difference between like when we talk about the oneness, those of us who, who teach this, we don't know what we mean. We're just trying to find words for that feeling of oneness, <laughs> you yeah. know, for that, right? So it's not like there's a thing and we're either really feeling it or not. We're just trying to describe that sense of all being well, of, of being, of there not being a huge separation between the different forms. So in that yeah. sense, if that's what you're feeling and that's how you want to describe it, that seems a reasonable description of it to me. Um, in terms of the pressure in your forehead, uh, so uh, let's do all the caveats here, Amir. I am not a doctor. I am uh, not qualified to say anything. Uh, you, if you listen to me, you're an idiot. What, else, what other disclaimers can we put out? Um, nothing that I say is Amir's fault unless you're upset about it, in which case it's all Amir's fault. All the disclaimers, right? Um, there is uh, a notion in Kundalini Yoga that when we open up to spiritual energy, sometimes the physical form needs some time to open up to it, that the energetic systems of the body have to actually expand in order to allow more of this life force spiritual energy to come through us. And one of the ways that can manifest is in headaches. Uh, Krishnamurti used to get terrible migraines, and they were closely associated in his mind with meditation. It is possible that that is what you're experiencing which is your body attempting to handle the amount of life that your system is open to. And it will, my experience is it will absolutely adapt to it over time. If I'm not completely full of shit, which I, I did have a spiritual experience at um, one stage, Michael, and I'd been trying to find a name for it because I had no idea what it is, but I can only describe it as like, a sense of ego that and at the time I felt this sort of like oneness with everything and I had this realization that basically you know I'm full of bullshit everything just is if that makes any sense well right and I think ultimately John that's like what we have to make our peace with is we're all full of bullshit and we're all one with everything <laughs> right? it's not an either or <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, we can definitely get up into our own heads too much. That's for sure. Oh yeah. Oh, thank you, Michael. A pleasure, John. Nice to nice to meet you. Virtually. Nice to meet you too. Okay. Next up, let's go to Jeremy. Go ahead, Jeremy. Hey, what's up, Michael? Hello. Hi. Hello. 
I have a question on how to move past fear. And, you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts recently on, is it Kathy for the soul? And for me, I feel like fear has been, I know I'm always feeling my thinking around fear and I know like all of this just kind of made up, but there are times I still, it feels like a really, really real mirage and I'm not quite sure. It almost feels like this, it feels like this kind of wall I can't cross to get to the next level. So let me, let me jump in a little, Jeremy. So uh, I'm not trying to be the word police. So don't hear it that way if you can help mm -hmm. it. But when you say, I know I'm feeling my thinking about fear. No, fear is your thinking. There isn't a thing called fear that exists independent of thought. The, 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 the feeling of it being like a wall is part of thinking of it as a thing. Mm -hmm. Right? So to the extent that fear looks, that, that fear has become thingified, mm -hmm. then of course you've got to deal with it. You've got to overcome it. You've got to get past it. To the extent that you can see Fear too is transient. It's, it's just another form that thought takes. Then it, it's fluid and you start to see, oh, actually, this is just the energy of thought taking form in me. And I've got an opinion about it maybe, but let's see if I can still lift a coffee cup while the energy of thought, yeah, still can lift a coffee cup. How about, can I still poke myself in the face with a pen? Yep. That still works. Can I still read a book? Well, I can't concentrate very well, but yeah, I can still do that. And you start to see it for what it is. And it stops looking like a thing that has to be overcome and just starts being part of the experience that you're having while you're doing what you're doing. Right. And yeah, at that point, it loses all its thinginess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like to use technical terms. I hope I didn't get too far out ahead of you there. But uh, no, actually, just it just cleared it up cool. instantly. So thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful, Jeremy. Thank you. Okay. Next up, let's go to Mark. Go ahead, Mark. It's all yours. Hello, Michael. Hello. Yeah. There he is. Hey. Yeah, here I am, here I am. Hi, hi. Um, okay, so uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Great, okay. So uh, thank you, by the way, for your video, which through watching completely changed the course of my life. And um, I was able to thank you three years ago at the Ticken conference. And in that 60 seconds, I loved the way, it was amazing. There were so many people around you, around you that wanted to speak to you and it felt like only you and me existed in those 60 seconds. So that was wonderful. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, and okay, also, Cause I always worry when somebody starts an anecdote like that, that I was a dick to them and they're about to out me, but I appreciate that work. Thank you. Yeah. If I ever get the opportunity, I promise I will do it. Yeah. Um, for, please. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I need okay. to keep getting over myself. This is great. Yeah. 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 I, I know that one as well for me. Um, okay. So, 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 okay. So I can thank you actually, uh, not so much for your response to the previous person when you just turned around and said, well, actually, I'm not the word police, so please don't take it like that. And you described fear as thought, uh, which completely threw the question that I had or, 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 or statement question, which was along the lines of, uh, it really does my head in. I've, I've, I've been around some people for a while now that the response to everybody's question or statement or feeling or experiences well it's just thought and, I, and, I, and i'm just like i often just don't find it in my experience observing gear on their behalf by proxy useful um and, and i don't know whether i heard you or someone else say but it's something that i subscribe to about meeting people where they're at um and so i i, I I've, I've been that dismayed I guess is a word maybe uh, around all of that that often I have the conversation in 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 some groups around well actually not everything is thought let's have a look at that one 
Uh, and then I get people that have been around for a while saying, well, Mark, actually everything is thought. Some people, that beautiful people that I absolutely love and I respect. And, 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 and there's part of me saying yes to so Mark, that. What's, what's the question part of it? Yeah. Like, I, mean, I am here in the, the context, yeah. but I'm not really getting so the, the question. question is, the question is, um, is there uh, something uh, that may not be thought? So, for instance, the, the physical injury and pain of an unexpected knife wound somewhere on the body. As uh, opposed to all those expected knife wounds we get. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm quibbling. <laughs> yeah. So, so you get where I'm coming from. I'm not aware. Yeah. I receive this injury, the pain hits me. So I've got this pain, not necessarily created by my own thought, I imagine. And, well, and, and so I'll, here, okay, and so but that's, let, 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 me, let me jump in on that example. Thank you. Right? We know the pain's created by thought because yeah. it's common as muck for somebody to not notice they've been stabbed until they see the knife wound. That's actually a very common description. They don't know their leg is broken until they realize their leg is broken. So until it comes into consciousness, until the thought is there, the pain isn't there. People have this thing called phantom limb pain. One of my uncles actually was one of the world's leading experts on it. And phantom limb pain clearly is made of thought because there's no limb and yet they feel pain in it. So pain is clearly made of thought. Now, if the question is, is the broken leg made of thought? I'm going to say for all practical purposes, no. But every single implication and experience you have of that broken leg is. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Okay, let's go to... Can I add something to that real quick, Michael? Yeah, please. This is really, this is really fascinating. So one of my, my, one of my good friends... Uh, recently had an injury on his foot and he went to the doctor and the doctor that he went to originally misdiagnosed it and said it was gout. So he went and looked up gout and he ended up having all the symptoms of someone who has gout on their feet. Turns out a month later, he goes back and it wasn't gout. It was, he had a broke yet small particles that were broken in his foot. The pain started to feel different because he was told a different thing. So, I mean, it just goes along the lines. I thought that was absolutely brilliant that he was able to experience two different things based on what was, what was told to him. Yeah, and I, I tell a story, I think it's in Space Within, and it's a true story, but it, it, there was a student on, on one of the early super coach academies who took great exception um, to, to my dismissing in his mind things as thought. I don't think of that as dismissing, but he did. And he said, look, I don't know about you, but if somebody comes to me with a broken leg, I'm going to go set the bone before I talk to them about the nature of thought. And I said to him, well, look, if I was a doctor, I, I, I would too. But I can pretty much guarantee you that as you start to settle down, you'll realize a lot less people have broken legs than you think. And, and ultimately, that for me is what it comes back to. Not at a debate about whether or not there's such a thing as circumstance, but beginning to see that there's a, a world of difference between a circumstance and experience. Cool. Okay, next up, let's go to Regula. You are unmuted, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Hello. Hello, everybody. I have just some difficulties with uh, the word, the term of God, using God mm -hmm. in the, with the three principles. I have a feeling for the whole or for being in mm -hmm. part of, or I am the whole and everything. But how, why, why use this word God? Like, I mean, in Europe, maybe it's also a little different than in, in the States. We have a, you know, I'm more... Can I tell you a secret, Rukula? I use it in Europe, too. Okay. I, I so, even used it in the, Kuwait two weeks ago. Okay. So I, I'm just wondering, because I feel somewhere in me a longing to be able to just use it, yeah. like from childhood, as like experiencing bigger, yeah, big insights, actually, as a child. And yet I have such a resistance to, 
accept that. And yet there is this longing and that's why I'm bringing this up. I feel yeah. kind of... So, so for me, and this is purely for me, I, I just don't think about it. So I notice that often I use the word God and sometimes I do. Now, what was interesting to me, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little, I did a talk in Denmark in 2014 for uh, uh, um, high potential leaders. So we had a lot of top leadership teams from companies in Denmark, some from the government, some from the t television, some from banking, from all over. And I noticed I didn't use the word God once, and it struck me. I just thought, oh, that's interesting. I'm not using the word God today. When at the end of the day, we had each team make a presentation about what they'd taken away. In Denmark, right, a godless country, every single team used the word God in their presentation of what they had taken away from the day. And that spoke to me. That was like, okay, it's, it's, it's not in the words. Now, there is in me a desire to take the stigma out of the word. So I do maybe use it a little bit more than I otherwise would because there is, I do have a little bit of an agenda to get people over the God phobia, right? So I'm bringing out a program in March that we filmed last year with Anita Moore Johnny, who's a, if you haven't read her book, Dying to Be Me, she's an amazing yeah. woman with an amazing story. And we called the program Experiencing God, but we didn't do it lightly. We started out calling the program Experiencing the Presence because that's what we were trying to describe, that, that sense of oneness, that sense of feeling. And then I looked at her one day and I said, I don't know about you, but I am only calling this experience in the presence because I'm chicken shit. And she said, yeah, me too. And so we changed the name to Experiencing God. That makes me cry now. <sighs> complete for now yes thank you very much thank you nice to meet you okay let's go to omar go ahead omar hello everyone hello on behalf of everyone I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm a student, I study psychology now, it's my second year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is, um, I had exams recently and I had exams about developmental psychology, about children and peer relationship. And uh, why revising for that? I, f I feel sometimes insecure because there are a lot of things in there that I don't agree with. Like, uh, you know, if you don't have this style of attachment, secure attachment, you will have problems, making good relationships with others and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I want to complete my degree, but I find it like uh, it's, you know, it's go against what I believe in right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just makes me feel uncomfortable. So see if this is helpful. If you take the word because out of what you just told me, let me play it back to you as I hear it without the cause effect built in. What I heard you say is, sometimes when I'm studying, I feel insecure. There are things in what I'm studying I don't agree with. I'd like to get my degree. Sometimes I feel uncomfortable when I think about it. All right? Those were the things I heard you say. Now, each one of those strikes me as just true. Right? If you try and connect them all up, then that's messy. But see, sometimes when you study, I feel you feel insecure. Sometimes when I do what I do, I feel insecure. Great. We're human. We think. That happens. Got it. There are things in what I'm studying I don't agree with. There are lots of things in what I study I don't agree with. And I have two ways of dealing with that. Sometimes I, I do what they talk about in Zen and I eat the fish whole and then spit out the bones later. Sometimes I pick and choose what I want. They're both well-honored, time-honored learning styles. Right? I want to finish my degree. 
great. It's really helpful to have that sense of direction. And I'm sure you know what you need to do to finish your degree. Sometimes when I'm thinking about it, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah, there's lots of stuff I think about that I feel uncomfortable when I think about it. So I tend not to think about it too much. No. Yeah, sometimes like when I'm revising, I, or sometimes I don't even like uh, the motivation to, to revise. I procrastinate a lot about it. So what to do with that? Like, well, I, I, I I'll tell you what to do. do you, have you ever heard the parable of the mustard seed? Say again? The parable of the mustard seed, right? It's, I think it's from the gospel of Thomas or one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, but apparently somebody came to Jesus with uh, their, um, their, their baby who had died and asked Jesus to bring him back to life. And Jesus said, bring me a mustard seed from a house that has not tasted death and I can bring your child back to life. And the, the story is she returns a day later, grace, grateful, recognized is part of the experience and accepting it. If you can find me one student in your dorms, one student in your class who does not procrastinate on their revision, then, then I'll, 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 I'll genuinely bring them on and I'll give you a coaching session for free. Because I guarantee you everybody in your program procrastinates on studying and doesn't feel like it sometimes. That's just how it works. That can't be a problem. And if it's not a real problem, you don't really need to do anything about it. Now, if it's the day of your exam and you still didn't study, all right, maybe, maybe then you left it a little late. But personally, I, my, my memory of university was uh, a lot of really late nights right towards the end of exam time, right? So, you know, you might, find, you might prefer it if you were a different person and did it differently. I would have preferred it if I was, but it's not going to stop you from getting your degree. It's not a character flaw in you. It's just, yeah, yeah, that's pretty common. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to Billy next. Go ahead, Billy. Um, hi, thank you everyone and Michael for this talk today. Um, coming from San Jose, uh, California today. Um, my question is very basic. Um, and it's, uh, I'm fairly new to the three principles and I came across Sid Banks, uh, talk actually, and then came to you and to this group. So, um, my interpretation of the three principles, I'm still coming to understanding of in, and I, my basic question is, I've sort of am thinking of, uh, the three principles in the terms of intuition. Is that, I know there might not be a necessarily a right or wrong answer to this, but is that maybe a proper way to kind of approach this, uh, you know, to advance my understanding of the three principles overall? So let me tell you how I hear the question, Billy, and that might help us get closer to what you're looking for for an answer. I, I heard that question as I tend to think of gravity in terms of rocks falling, is that a useful way to think about gravity? I would say, oh, go ahead. Well, just so in my mind, like, yeah, one of the things that gravity does is causes rocks to fall, but that's not a definition of gravity. So one of the experiences we have that the principles explain is what we call intuition, where we seem to know something that we, we shouldn't logically know. And yet the, 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 the capacity of this deeper intelligence in us does allow us that, that experience that we describe as intuition, but that's no more a full explanation of the nature of, of, of the deeper universal mind than rocks fall being a, a, a full 
explanation of what gravity is. Does that make any sense as an analogy or have I gone too far down, down that road? No, no, it does. Definitely gives me a little bit more clarity or a lot more clarity. I appreciate that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's bring on Jamie and then I will bring back Amir to wrap things up. Go ahead, Jamie. It's all yours. Thank you. Hiya. Hiya, Michael. Hello. Um, so, so a, a previous caller, Omar, I think it was, uh, brought up that he was doing a psychology degree. Um, I'm a social worker. I, I work with um, teenagers who have been through a lot in their lives and are homeless and abusive situations, etc. Um, and I share what I can with them. And I find it's helpful from my own understanding, from my own place. Um, and it, it seems to be helpful to them. Um, but of course, the uh, the mainstream psychological profession and the social work profession, again, I feel is um, uh, quite reliant on uh, well-researched and well-documented theories, which potentially isn't as up-to-date as what we're talking about now. So my question is, when do you think that this is going to become more mainstream. I mean, there's, there's loads of us on this call now. You've got book, loads of people have got books out and it's, it's evolving and it's fantastic to see. But when do you think it'll become part of a psychology degree, for example? I, I would be very surprised if it isn't already part of a psychology degree somewhere. Mm. Um, it, just because there are always psychology programs uh, that that kind of just grab onto what's out there and and introduce it as a thread. When it becomes mainstream, I I, I literally would be just twenty forty three. <laughs> like like I don't know. It'll be a Tuesday at one p.m. Like, like like I don't think there is actually a point at which you can say officially now. I mean, you know, some people would say, well, it's official when it's on Oprah or it's official when uh, it's in every university. I, I mean, maybe there is. A have you spoken to Oprah yet? I have spoken so many times to the tier of people below Oprah. I've been okay. told not to worry about it. I've been rejected six times and I've been told until they reject me 10 times, I shouldn't even worry about it. Oh, there we are. So I'm six tenths of the way there. Um, but but, but I... I, I in terms of the sort of larger context, I, I have a lot of hope for this. Like I got into this in 2007. Mm. Literally in 2007, there was one website that came up if you searched for, for, for the principles. Right? So the difference the last 10 years is so phenomenal that it seems to me inevitable that at some point, some version of this understanding gets incorporated into the mainstream, whether it is as the three principles as originally uncovered and taught by Sidney Banks, or whether it is as part of some other psychological form, mm. or whether it is simply at a level of consciousness that more people carry with them without any words for it that enables us to work better as a society. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's beyond my can. But, but what fun to be at the vanguard. What fun to be part of the wave that is washing over people. What fun to be part of the spark that's setting fires around the world. Mm. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Jamie. Amir, you want the last five minutes? Yeah, well, last two minutes and then three minutes for Michael again. I just wanted to say, first of all, again, this was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I love when you talk, Michael, something, something that just, just does something for me. And I know for everyone here, I want to say for people that are coaches here, um, this has been the coolest thing to have a book out like this, because I've enrolled two clients by simply giving this and saying, I'm going to read it along the lines with you and let's see what shows up. It's a great primer to bring them to introduce the principles. If you're a coach out there, um, not saying you should do this as a strategy or a tool. It's been really awesome for me. So Michael, thank you for getting me two more clients uh, in a roundabout way. But uh, can you just speak a little bit about the last two minutes about your book and um, what you're doing with it? I know you have a program out. Would you just kind of briefly? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, the whole thing started as a program, 
like I've been doing since 2009 in different forms. And, and when it started, it was kind of a hybrid of my old coaching and what I was learning about the principles. And then I had to stop for a year and kind of let it settle. And I, I came back with a trial. I did an eight week version where I wanted to see, could I, just from my understanding of the principles, could I help people create cool shit in the world? And I found actually even better than before. And so then I expanded it back out into the 90 day program and finally got, to, it took me a couple of years, but finally kind of was able to write it down in a way that it seems to help people even without me over their shoulder. It seems to kind of be a, a good substitute for me over their shoulder. I still am going to do the program because I love actually engaging with people about what they actually want to create. So I, as far as I know, certainly this year we're going to do the program again uh, and I plan to keep doing it. And we just try and kind of bombard people with inspiration. Um, you, you know, and there's something about being in a community where everyone is in over their head that really there's a support network that comes out of that. It's like being in the foxhole together without having to go to war. Right. It's like we're all not we all don't know how we're going to get there. And yet we're all moving forward day by day. And there's something so fun about being part of that game. And so for the people who don't like people, <laughs> right, you got a book. It's fine for the people who love doing it as part of a community, which I'm guessing a lot of the people in your community do. Then I love the program for that. Beautiful. Awesome. And yeah, this is my second go around with it too. And I can't wait. And thank you everyone for being on this call and your questions. And again, Michael, I'm so grateful for you stepping in here for, for an hour and taking the time out of your busy day to do this. So thank you everyone. Give them a big wave and a goodbye and a, and a kiss right. if you want to. And thank you again, Michael. And hopefully we'll get to see you soon. A pleasure. I uh, hope to see you soon. And thank you everybody. Really nice to meet those of you I haven't seen before. Take thank care. You. I will unmute you all. Bye. 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 Thank you guys. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.